Okay. So Constance Garnett, the translator of the, the version that we read, knew Dostoevsky, or at least met him once or twice. Um, and it was kind of contemporary with him. So the language that you get, the, the ethos and the spirit of the way in which Constance Garnett translates Dostoevsky um, is uh, very faithful, but she butchers some of the language and ideas to make it sound modern and, and like her, um, her time periods uh, English. The uh, Pelear and Volonsky um, version is more authentic to uh, the original Dostoevsky, though it loses kind of that uh, modern 19th century feel um, where Constance Garnett like really keeps it because that's where she came from. She came from um, the time of aristocracy and um, uh, high ethics in Europe. Um, so anyways, uh, the Grand Inquisitor passage is, is maybe even one of my favorite just like sections of any book from 19th century literature. Um, and it, it stands out not only for its philosophical content, which we're gonna mostly focus on today, um, but also in large part for its um, literary power. It, it has a certain narrative purpose in the book that we get a lot of. Um, and then I can sort of talk about by giving the background of the, the book structure and story and, and how this passage fits into it. Um, but we won't get the most powerful piece, which also gives a philosophical color to um, the arguments that are made here because it is a spoiler basically for the book. Um, and so for this lecture, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna do my best not to spoil the novel. So it's, it, it is, commitment to read this book like this is my hand the width of my hand right it, it's 700 ish pages and I wasn't even finished there was supposed to be a whole other part um but Dostoevsky died uh, and it's it's like mostly finished he had like hopes to write um uh a final portion uh, of the book but but it is like a complete and uh clean version Dostoevsky I I want to say it was published in 1860 and he died four or six months later. So this is his magnum opus novel. Um, it is a collection and culmination of all of the thoughts and ideas that had been swirling around in his short stories and his other novels uh, throughout his entire career. And it's, it's really a masterpiece all the way through. Um, if you already like 19th century literature, you like the... Um, aristocratic ethic and voice and, and that kind of storytelling where um, you know rich people fall in love with each other and have all sorts of um, intrigues and whatnot, um, then you'll love this book, right? Because you're already taking an existentialism class, so you're stoked on those kinds of ideas. And you, know, you, you like that kind of story. Even if you don't like that kind of story, it does pull you in, um, which is a quality of Dostoevsky. Um, if you uh, are interested in more analytic novels. Um, but as I was saying, I'm not gonna spoil it for you. We'll just talk about the Grand Inquisitor passage, but know that um, there's another chapter called The Devil um, that turns the Grand Inquisitor passage completely on its head um, and, uh, and, and makes Ivan's conception of it that much more absurd. Uh, but to talk about that part would give away like the coolest part of the novel. It's, it's like the moment where when you read it, you set the book down and sit and stare a thousand mile stare for five, 10 minutes, you know? Um, okay, so as I've promised in the last few weeks, uh, after a brief introduction of existentialism, you know, like with the stranger and um, our sort of uh, conceptual motley from the first week, uh, we're gonna go back to existentialism's beginnings, at least when it really starts having um, a robust form and character, which is in Dostoevsky. So Dostoevsky is, is largely considered to be one of the like grandfathers of existentialism, where uh, people had been talking, like Quentin mentioned, about the problem of evil for centuries before Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky is the first to give it a really um, palpable feel of absurdism. And uh, many of the concepts present in, especially the Brothers Karamazov, but um, throughout uh, his corpus and Crime and Punishment and The Idiot um, are picked up on by the other core text 
um, existentialists, Camus, Sartre, Beauvoir, all of them cite Dostoevsky, uh, as well as Kierkegaard. And the reason that uh, we're going to, to Dostoevsky first, as we like roll the clock backwards on existentialism to learn more about what the problematic of being is and, and how it takes form and what its character is so that we can see the, the main thrusts of solution that uh, solutions that come from our uh, French existentialists, um, is that uh, I think it's it's a nice introduction. It comes after Kierkegaard. I mean, Dostoevsky and Kierkegaard are semi-contemporaneous, but Dostoevsky is writing a little bit after. Um, and the I feel that the literary component to it, the fact that it's a story and told as a story through the eyes and mouths of characters, um, gives it uh, a personable feel so that we can really get grip on it before um, digging deeper into more philosophical territory, which we will do next week with Fear and Trembling. Um, so I haven't posted the Fear and Trembling selection that I want you to read yet, um, but I will tonight. So that'll be up on Canvas this evening. I just have to scan it out of this book. So I have it with me. Um, so we're gonna look at the beginnings of existentialism, which for the French, existential, for the French existentialists um, is an atheistic endeavor um, for the predecessors to French existentialism and really existentialism in general. Uh, it is not an atheistic uh, endeavor. There are um, deep roots to religion and the relationship between uh, mankind and God um, that inspire the original um, or the first formulations of the problematic being um, that becomes taken up by our atheist existentialists um, one, two generations later. Uh, so for Dostoevsky, the absurd is a condition that's met by humankind trapped between world and God, um, as opposed to for the French existentialists trapped between um, the need for meaning and, and the inability to provide it, or uh, one's expression of freedom and the um, the, the fate, fatalistic form of the world that we live in, however that gets characterized. Um, and there's no clear treatment than this particular problem, uh, the condition of being between uh, God and world, um, than in the Grand Inquisitor passage. So um, we're going to start with a brief introduction to Dostoevsky, who he was, where he's coming from, uh, what his life's all about. Um, and I remembered, well, it was actually written in these lecture notes that I'd written for a previous semester, what the name of that fallacy was that I talked about last week. So when you like interpret a work with the life of the author of that work uh, in mind, using that author as uh, a, a kind of texture to understand the, the work, it's called the intentional fallacy. Um, if you're interested, it, it's probably something you'd talk about more in a English department or like history of English literature or something like that, um, or history of commentary on English literature, probably. I don't know if those classes exist. Um, but yeah, the, the intentional fallacy was a really bad thing to be accused of the intentional fallacy in an English department uh, in the 60s and um, uh, maybe even 70s too. But that's faded away. And so thankfully we can uh, talk about Dostoevsky's life with uh, without fear of retribution from my department. Okay, so um, these, this, this part of the lecture is um, largely inspired by Nabokov uh, who wrote Lolita. Um, if you know Lolita, it's an awesome book. Um, Nabokov and Dostoevsky are like complete opposite ends of a literary spectrum where Dostoevsky writes novels that are analytic and conceptual, like, like every character and narrative object is for the sake of either argument or conception. Uh, Nabokov is like the exact opposite. Nabokov is indulgent in aesthetics and in um, the, the, the artistic expression to try and get you to, to elicit in his readers uh, a visceral feeling of the, the novels and stories that he, he's writing. Um, so they live on completely opposite ends of the spectrum. So um, there, there will be a couple of jabs from Novikov at, at Dostoevsky through this. So anyways, um, Fyodor Dostoevsky, born 1821, um, was uh, 
born into a, a poor family. Um, his father was a doctor and like a petty tyrant. He was a real jerk and probably a drunk. And uh, he was so awful, Dostoevsky's dad, that he was murdered under mysterious circumstances. So he was probably like engaging in some uh, like back alley, uh, you know, uh, something at night, drunk, harvesting some person's organs to sell them and you know, caught, you know, like that kind of guy, right? So Dostoevsky's born to like this awful father, um, drunk and tyrannical, um, and he's like murdered early on in Dostoevsky's life. Um, Nabokov thinks that Ivan's character, the one that tells the, the poem of the Grand Inquisitor, uh, might under a Freudian lens be interpreted as uh, a characterization of Dostoevsky's father, but I, I don't know what to say about that. Um, so 1848, Dostoevsky is now, what, 26? Is that right? He's born at 27. Um, in several European countries, there had been, in 1848, 1848 is like a, an amazing year. A, why, like, look it up in Wikipedia. It is absolutely nutty. So in 1848, all across Europe, and not just Europe, but it like sparks this, this anti- uh, monarchical revolution around the world, even in South America, right? Um, there are uh, all sorts of upheavals uh, where the the people are um, uh, standing up for themselves against the monarchy, against uh, aristocracy, and beginning to like take power back for themselves. Uh, and this is a generation after the French Revolution and uh, the Napoleonic Wars, right? So we're we're very close to um, these times of like deep unrest in Europe. Um, so no surprise that uh, the, the old structure of things, the old aristocratic way of um, being political and, and living in society was uh, beginning to decompose uh, or recompose itself rather in 1848 into um, more democratic-ish feelings that again, inspired the whole world. Anyways, 1848, um, there's this uh, you know, wave of anti-monarchical uh, sentiment across Europe and Russia being home to the czars, right, which is the Russian uh, uh, king, um, the, the royal family, it's, it's Russian or, or um, Slavic for Caesar, Tsar, Caesar, right, Kaiser um, in German. Uh, the, the Russian government um, cracks down on all dissenters. So basically, if you speak out, it's not all that different from today's Russia. If you speak out against the, the powers that be in government, you are sent to Siberia. Um, now, Dostoevsky is a young author, 27, um, sort of in his prime intellectually, um, and really inspired to, to see the change that uh, he wants to see a, a, as you know, anti-monarchical um, uh, feelings throughout Russia. And, and uh, it's, it's a big question what to do in Russia, especially for the, the intellectual elite, these young authors, especially the ones that sort of pull themselves up through their creativity and their creative powers uh, to um, uh, become figureheads in Russian society through their works. Uh, Belinsky and uh, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, um, all these guys are, are um, operating in, in a sort of similar intellectual space where they, for the most part, uh, at least share a, an aversion to the nihilistic communism of the day, um, as well as to the uh, brutal um, oligarchy that was the aristocratic society of, of Russia at the time, and, and trying to find a balance. And Tolstoy's balance is his own, probably best um, expressed in Anna Karenina. Um, but maybe Death of Ivan Illich too. Um, but Dostoevsky has his own strange way of coping with all of these political problems through his own um, philosophical uh, crucible that is you know, best seen in Brothers Karamazov. Anyways, Belinsky is, is uh, a French-inspired Russian author who being French-inspired is all about like liberty and justice and democracy and uh, goes into exile, leaves for France and sends this letter that um, takes the, the czar to task. Um, and the letter is placed on a, a list of especially banned books, not just a, a banned uh, book, but like if you're caught with this, you, you get in real trouble. Um, 
And uh, it was full of insolent expressions against the Orthodox Church, against supreme power in general, being like God, right? Um, and so the idea is to circulate this amongst the intellectual elite of Russia to, again, inspire this kind of anti-monarchical change. Um, at a party, like a, an evening of authors in Russia, Dostoevsky is um, caught in, uh, by the police uh, and everybody at the party is like passing around these pamphlets from Belinsky and um, the police arrest everyone. Uh, Dostoevsky and all of his buddies at the party, they, these are just, you know, like authors um, who are caught reading a letter, not even publishing anything about it, but they're caught with it. Um, they're sentenced to eight years of hard labor in Siberia, um, which was later commuted by uh, the czar to four, so and a half. Um, but there was this monstrously cruel procedure that followed the, um, the sentencing. Uh, rather than being told you're sentenced to eight years in prison, they were told they were to be shot by firing squad to death. Though this was never actually gonna happen, right? That's just what they were told. That the the uh, magistrate decided to play a sick joke on these um, thin-blooded authors. Um, so the group of authors are taken to uh, the place where they were assigned to be executed, uh, stripped of their shirts, and the first batch of prisoners were tied to posts. The firing squad takes aim, uh, and when they take aim, the, uh, the, the officer in charge raises his hand, and rather than saying fire, reads the actual sentence to the prisoners. One of the men went entirely mad, completely lost his mind, and a deep scar was left in Dostoevsky for the rest of his life. Um, that, that moment carved into his soul, waiting to die, much like Marceau, right, in his prison cell, waiting to die, waiting for the dawn to come, knowing that his final hours were there, uh, and then being released from this uh, awful fate uh, by surprise all at once, and then told that, no, you just got to go live with the most hardened evil criminals in all of Russia, um, in the coldest, most desolate, awful place in Russia, the Siberian work camps, right? Um, and in these work camps, uh, Siberia treats Dostoevsky terribly. He is put together with pedophiles and murderers and uh, killers and just vicious evil people, criminals of the worst sort. Um, and all Dostoevsky has to keep his sanity is a Bible. And so Dostoevsky reads and rereads this Bible over and over for four years um, while he's watching men uh, rape and murder one another brutally, right? Because there was no, uh, Russia didn't care. You were a prisoner in Siberia. You do what you want to each other just so long as you hit your rocks uh, for enough hours during the day, right? Um, with your, your pickaxes. Um, so Dostoevsky returns from Siberia, a completely changed man. Um, he becomes a gambler and uh, completely addicted to gambling. He, he gambles away his entire fortune. He marries twice has an affair with this awful woman. Um, so his love life is completely rent apart. Um, his second marriage works out for him eventually, but he doesn't get married again until like later in his life. He has a young son who is like the joy of his life. The, the son has epilepsy and dies at a young age. Um, the son is represented in a bunch of different characters throughout Dostoevsky's novels. And this one, Alyosha, although Smerdyakov is another character. Smerdyakov is like, an awful character and um, is the one with epilepsy. In The Idiot, Prince Mishkin is, is based on Dostoevsky's like perfect son. Um, and so when Dostoevsky returns from Siberia, um, his essential ideas begin to ripen. This, the, the period post-Siberia is when he develops um, his project that makes him uh, world famous, world historically famous for probably the rest of time. He will remain a literary icon um, because of the, the four novels and the short stories that he publishes. Um, and in these, um, Dostoevsky discusses salvation through transgression, where we uh, sin our way to um, salvation um, of, of ethical supremacy um, through suffering, that by suffering, we, uh, we transcend, we become better people. Um, he defends free will uh, as a moral proposition over and above uh, a metaphysical one. So, so free will is, is something that is more morally important than it is metaphysically important. 
um, and uh, to be true to oneself uh, and recognize the responsibility of, of that phrase is uh, more important than following any um, particular religious bent. Although Dostoevsky is deeply religious, he's very religious in his own really strange way. He's orthodox, but not orthodox at all. Um, the orthodox Christian that is like the Russian form of um, Christianity that follows from the, the split of Rome, right? Half of Rome um, in the West uh, inspires Catholicism and in the East inspires the orthodoxy. Um, and Dostoevsky lives at both ends of a spectrum. He embodies a kind of egoistic antichrist form of European uh, moralism, where his characters are often awful, terrible people that by virtue of their awfulness become great, right? They, they um, become amazing. Raskolnikov in Crime of Punishment comes to mind. Um, and also, he, he embodies this like brotherhood of Christ and Russia sort of vibe that, that he is deeply inspired by these religious idealisms and tries to find where these two opposites can blend together in his characters. And um, Nabokov says, this is a direct quote, I do not like this trick his characters, Dostoevsky's characters have of sinning their way to Jesus. Um, it was uh, idiosyncratic to Dostoevsky himself, that, that quality and character that, um, uh, you have this struggle in, in all of his main characters. And in, in the Brothers Karamazov, it's a little bit different because as we'll talk about when I introduce the characters, every brother represents a different feature, every Karamazov really, because the father counts too, represents a different feature of the human soul, of the, the human um, whole, like what it is to be human. And so it's the characters that struggle against one another rather than like one character having these strange like brotherhood of Christ and antichrist feelings all like compacted into one. Um, so it really works in Brothers Karamazov in, in my opinion. Um, great. So one important thing to note is that Dostoevsky's characters are concepts, they're ideas, they represent um, arguments or, or, or uh, states, uh, the views about the way that the world is or the way humankind is, they're almost two-dimensional in that way. Um, they're not aesthetic human things, they're ideas, right? Uh, and so again, Nabokov, what landscape there is, is a landscape of ideas in a Dostoevsky novel, a moral landscape. The weather does not exist in his world, so it does not much matter how people dress, Dostoevsky characterizes his people through situation, through ethical matters, their psychological reactions, and their, uh, it, their inside ripples. So again, you, you get like Nabokov, the inside ripples, this really like visceral language, um, completely the opposite from Dostoevsky. Um, and Dostoevsky, again, Nabokov says of him because of this, that Dostoevsky missed his, uh, his chance at being Russia's greatest playwright because as a playwright, you only need to throw in the background scenery that's absolutely necessary to move the story forward, which is just how he writes his novels. Um, okay, so that's Dostoevsky. Um, we'll talk about the brothers Karamazov. Uh, great, okay. So um, now that we have a grasp on Dostoevsky as an author, let's get a grasp on the landscape of the novel in which the Grand Inquisitor appears. So um, every character in this novel, the, the main characters, at least the Karamazovs, as I said, represent an aspect of human nature. So Fyodor Karamazov, the, the father, represents the body. He's, he's a sensualist. He is an old pig of a man. He has a big old like goiter on his neck, he's ugly and disgusting and awful. He's a money lender. This is how he becomes rich. Um, and, and this is like looked down on, right? Uh, that that uh, there's a, in, in Christianity, at least originally, it was uh, sort of faux pas to lend money to be like a, a, a banker, basically, um, which is part of the reason that, that um, the, the Jewish communities picked up banking and then became like hyper rich everywhere because Christianity says like, you ought not to, to lend money, it's sinful. Um, usury, right? usury, yeah, exactly. So, um, so 
just uh, Fedor, just, or Fe sorry, Fedor Karamazov, um, the father of the brothers Karamazov, um, is a centralist, uh, a user. Um, he has orgies at his house all the time. He, he invites all of the town's prostitutes and um, parties and drinks uh, for hours on end. Um, he, is, he represents unrestricted egoism, um, Epicureanism to the highest degree. Uh, and then there are his sons. There's Ivan, who is the, the author of this poem, The Grand Inquisitor, um, who represents the mind. He's, he is the existentialist of this novel. Um, Ivan is, is the intellect and the way that the intellect engages with the world, where his father is, is the body and the way that the body interacts with the world. Uh, there is Alexei Alyosha, um, who uh, is also a main character in the chapter that we read. Um, Alyosha, as I mentioned very briefly, is largely based on Dostoevsky's young son who died of epilepsy. Um, he represents the soul, the, that perfect, untouchable, uh, indefatigable part of um, what it is to be human. The, the part that always, that, that is there with us when we are born and when we are children and never quite goes away. That we can uh, bite of the fruit, right? We can grow up and become an adult, but we never quite lose connection to that child that we were. At least I think so. I, I think that there's always a piece of that, even in um, the worst among us. And Alyosha is this part of what it is to be human. He's the soul, he's innocence, he's a religious spirit. Um, he represents the higher things and everyone in the book loves him, absolutely everybody. Uh, the good ones, the bad ones. Um, and and he, it, it's almost as if he's open to everyone and that's all it takes um, to be a blank slate, to be a sponge for everyone to express themselves um, and to remain so pure in spite of absorbing all of these different energies and ideas and, and expressions from the good and the bad around him. He remains pure in spite of it. Uh, and then there's the, the third brother, Dimitri. Dimitri, we don't see um, in this passage, though uh, he is perhaps the most important character in the novel. Um, Dimitri Karamazov represents the heart, the passions. He represents nobility, the noble spirit, the the old aristocracy, the old aristocracy as it was experienced in good faith, right? Before it became about having uh, a copse of land with a uh, hundred souls, meaning like a hundred slaves or serfs lived on your land and, and you control them. That was like to be pretty rich. Um, and Dimitri represents nobility as it comes from the, the old stories of, of chivalry, right? Where this Arthurian tradition sweeps through Europe in 14, 1500s or so. And uh, you read like Chaucer and, and these guys, right? This is the kind of nobility that Dimitri represents. And, and so here we have what is almost, according to Dostoevsky, a complete picture of human nature. We have the body the sensualist experience of body that left alone will seek its pleasures without uh, remorse or uh, uh, second guessing. And then there's Ivan, the mind, the intellect. There is the way that we think through problems. We conceive, we analytically structure the world about us and move through it as such. And then we have the soul. We have that part of us that ever remains in innocent, that is our ability to love and connect to feel compassion, to um, be in the world together. And finally, there's the noble spirit. There is our heart. There is our desire to, um, to, to be proud and individual, to make our way in the world as ourselves, to have a first name, to have a last name that we can be proud of, right? Um, and this is Dimitri. Um, and Dimitri says, everything is permissible to the intelligent man, right? Um, this is a, a famous quote from Dostoevsky and the way that it is expressed in Ivan's because Ivan says something very similar. Um, Ivan at dinner the night before the Grand Inquisitor passage is given says, God doesn't exist. Um, and for this reason, everything is permissible, uh, which Sartre will quote later. And you see a bunch of debate on the internet. It, it's stupid because it's, it doesn't, it's a misinterpretation of a translation of a book, um, but, but 
there are people that say, oh, Dostoevsky never said God doesn't exist, so everything's permissible. He never said it exactly like that, but it's like two sentences. It happens in three, four different places. Um, there is no God, therefore everything is permissible, right? He does say it. Um, and Dimitri's version is for the intelligent man, everything is permissible. Um, and for Alyosha, love is permissible, always. It doesn't matter who, you can be uh, scum of the earth. Um, love is still permissible. And for Ivan, rebellion is permissible. With the death of God, with the non-existence of God, um, we, we have Ivan, the mind's resolution that um, rebellion is permissible. And then there's an interesting character again that we don't see that comes up actually in the chapter directly following this one. It's called An Obscure One for Now, because Ivan has a conversation with this character, Smerdyakov. Um, and, and it's that chapter that um, sets in place the entire dramatic motion of the book. Um, anyway, Smerdyakov means son of the reeking one. So uh, Akov is son of, and uh, uh, Smerd is smelly. Um, and the story of, of Smerdyakov is uh, there was a, a woman in town uh, who was uh, uh, mentally handicapped and homeless. And so she would like, she had like, you imagine like a kind of crazy woman with one dreadlock, you know, on her head. And she's like rolling around in the dirt all the time. And people like give her food and clothes. She would always rip off the clothes and like put on her dirty rags again. Um, and, you know, eat like one tenth of whatever was given to her. Um, and uh, she shows up one day in Fyodor uh, Karamazov, the, the father, the the centralist, right? His his house and gives birth to Smerdyakov, and so uh, and and dies in, in childbirth. Um, so Fyodor takes on Smerdyakov as his valet, as his main servant. And so, son of the reeking one is is this character's name, and and he represents hatred, resentment, disgust, nihilism, um, the worst parts of political Russia, the the communism without remorse. This um, uh, anarchical um, pressure that also had, was at play in Russia um, at the time that paired so well with the communists. The communists and the anarchists both wanted the same goal, which was to kick out the, the monarchy. And so they, they often worked together and, and came sort of hand in hand intellectually. Um, and at the very beginning of the novel, Dostoevsky says, there's a demon inside all of us probably representative of his own demons, the ones that came from his time in Siberia being threatened with, um, with execution uh, and, and then uh, laid bare the, the most horrific, horrendous portions of humanity, the, the lowest lows, the most inhuman humans for four years that um, one could experience Dostoevsky did. And, um, whether this implanted a demon inside of him or revealed the demon that always was and that is in everyone. Um, there is a demon inside all of us, says Dostoevsky. And so Smerdyakov, in my estimation, insofar as I'm interpreting all of these characters as uh, aspects of human nature, represents the demon inside. So the Grand Inquisitor passage, again, as I mentioned, comes a night after dinner um, with all of the, the Karamazov family together uh, and Ivan being the, uh, the cringe lord that he is, the 23-year-old existentialist uh, meme god says, God is dead, uh, so everything is permissible and, you know, like glasses shatter and everybody gasps and Dimitri, you know, in a rage, like runs out of the house and Alyosha feels kind of sad and sheepish, you know, like puppy dog eyes. Um, Smerdyakov smirks and uh, Fyodor <laughs> humble bumbles about, right? Um, the Grand Inquisitor passage happens a day after this, right? Um, and it is a conversation between the soul, Alyosha, and the mind, Ivan. And uh, Alyosha and Ivan, um, don't share much of their adult life together. Ivan went off to school early and they, though they spent their young childhood together, um, they don't know each other very well. So this is kind of like their first interaction with one another one-on-one -on -one since they were kids. Um, and 
Uh, and so Ivan says, well, of course, we in the green of youth have to settle the eternal questions first of all. And so what follows in the, the rebellion chapter in the Grand Inquisitor is Ivan's, and it turns out at the very end in the final moment, Alyosha's settling of the internal questions. Um, so Ivan's creed in this is that even if I've lost faith in everything that there is in the world beyond all logic, I would want to go on living, to go on loving the world, right? That uh, the, the Euclidean world says that two parallel lines must always uh, uh, stay apart from one another, but um, some say in the infinite span of things, the parallel lines will eventually cross. Um, and Ivan says, even if I lost faith in the world beyond all logic in, in this state in which impossibilities could occur, I would still want to love the world that I can only know as what he calls Euclidean or sensible, logical, the world that he exists in right now. And this is a creed, right, um, that will get context and, and should become in context more powerful for Ivan because what he understands the world to be is absurd and awful. Um, and so to lose faith in it, but still want to go on living and to go on loving the world in spite of what's to follow the story of awful torture of children and um, you know, a, a grand noble lie to the whole world, um, we're still uh, uh, wanting to love it. It's, it's an existentialist creed and a hint at Ivan's rebellious nature. Um, so the conversation takes place in, in the form of an argument, at least initially in the rebellion chapter, there's three sorts of arguments that inspire um, the final pass, which is the Grand Inquisitor. This is Ivan's most powerful form of the same argument that he sort of develops. Um, it's, the, I think, the fourth pass at the same thing. Um, and so there are three arguments in Ivan's discussion with Alyosha, and we'll cover two of them and finish, well, no, that was, for the old one, that was supposed to be two days. We'll do all of it today. Um, but before we do, I wanna take a quick break and put us into little breakout groups for say like five minutes. Before I talk about what we read today, I want you guys to like warm yourselves up by talking about it together. So again, like we did with the stranger before I color your intuitions with uh, lecture and content and you know, like fitting the concepts together, um, let your naked eyes, you know, uh, yeah, open them up and share what you got together. Uh, so I'm gonna break you out into groups. Um, I'll pause the recording. Okay, so um, now that we're back, uh, what do we think? What, what, uh, what were, were there any major impressions that, that uh, we had? What, what did our groups come up with? Did we come up with anything or we just stare at each other in silence for five minutes? Yeah, you did. It's a little awkward. Uh, Scott. Uh, one of the things that we talked about that we found interesting was that there's in, in like the contemporary conception of an atheist and a theist talking, it's gonna be about science versus not science, but that Ivan was using theology to have this discussion. And, and he's engaging in theological ideas to work through his own feelings and his own thoughts. And so for me, it's like, that's probably why a lot of it feels a little bit more ambiguous is that he's relying on the, a philosophical school of thought that requires belief in God to talk about whether God exists or not. It's a lot cleaner cut if somebody just talks about science and just Hawkins Razor, no big deal for the other stuff. Sure, it's kind of absurd, right? Um, which I think is part of the idea, right? Ivan doesn't believe in God. Uh, the mind has no ability to believe, right? The mind thinks, and uh, it thinks, well, if God exists, then where? Uh, and everywhere Ivan looks, he sees the suffering of children and um, the corruption of mankind. Um, so of course, uh, there is no God for Ivan. Um, and yet, you're right, he, he uses... Um, religion as a vehicle, as a tool, um, religious thought and storytelling narrative, religious narrative to express not the existence or non-existence of God, because that doesn't matter to Ivan. What matters is the, his resolution to be, to exist in the world and how he's, how he's going to exist in the world um, with youth and with the power of youth until he's 30 and then probably kill himself. Um, because it'll be for that long, he'll be able to bear 
the freedom and the suffering of, of the world. And, um, and after that, I see the instant weekend, it won't be worth it anymore. Um, and part of this is also, it's a story of its time. Um, the world in 1860 is not the world in 2021. Um, in 2021, uh, far more people are a religious, uh, agnostic or nuns, meaning that they're like probably still religious. They just don't identify with any like particular uh, form of Christianity or Judaism or um, wh whatever, you know, floats your boat. Um, uh, so people today are far less religious than they were back then. Back then, everybody was religious unless you were a communist. Um, and, uh, and so to communicate in this way is to communicate to your audience, right? Um, so there's some of that too. What else we got? Insights from group? Sarah? Yeah, I just, I kind of want to just throw in here. Um, he seemed like a brother who, I mean, you, you brought it up there a little bit. This is kind of a big deal to me. He seemed like he was kind of um, trying to shock his younger brother, trying to be a little more extreme than um, maybe he would have expressed his ideas otherwise to sort of deal with the idealism of a younger brother who he wanted to kind of wake up out of his stupor of maybe idealism or hope where he thought, but I did get the sense that he did really believe the things he was saying, but I don't know if you've ever had the experience where you're, you're telling the truth, but you're saying it in sort of a joking way because you know the other people can't relate at all, but the things you're saying are actually true about what you think. And it kind of seemed like that to me, like he was sort of lovingly, teasingly, but harshly sort of playing against his brother's youthful idealism and trying to give him a smack kind of into like a, a, a reality of what if all this that you were counting on isn't really there and all the romance and roses and flowers and love and hope. And because he believes it, but it also seems like he loves his younger brother and he thinks maybe freedom, like there's something else you can hold on to and maybe it's freedom, but th there's something more he can do if he gives up these other ch chains. Like he sees these things maybe as partly chains, but I was also kind of thrown by the, con the religious context that it, it seemed very religiously contextualized versus Camus. And I, it made me confused about whether he was really a believer in some way in God, but also in God as being a mean-spirited kind of Zeus sort of who plays chess with people. Yeah. Anyway, those were my thoughts. Yeah, no, I, I think you're totally right. And um, so I think it's a, a, a fine balance interpretively uh, how we read Ivan's um, uh, demeanor towards Alyosha. Um, I think you're right that there's like a playful harshness that all Ivan wants to do is to express himself, but in, in a way he is kind of imposing himself. But, but at the same time, he respects Alyosha for Alyosha's purity and so won't impose too much. It, notice it's only when Alyosha like talks back, when, when Alyosha responds to Ivan's initial arguments, which I'll, I'll talk about here in a minute, um, that Ivan actually does give the Grand Inquisitor. He doesn't come right out with the strongest formulation of his argument. He expresses it a few different softer sorts of ways as the conversation goes on. Um, and so it's invited by Alyosha. It's not imposed upon him completely, um, but it is still shocking. Um, and, and I think that this is part of what I, I read in, in Ivan's voice is, is a kind of irony because he recognizes how shocking this must be to Alyosha, but, um, but, but also like a kind of bashfulness, like, like he's trying to not be so harsh at the same time because he does love his brother. Um, and, uh, and so, so again, it's like this really fine line that, that um, they walk. And uh, after this conversation, Alyosha goes to uh, the monastery where he's been like studying or living with this uh, Father Zosima, he's a super famous hermit guy that blesses people and heals them with miracle and stuff. Uh, 
And Zosima is dying. And so Zosima like tells Alyosha the story of his life and how he got to be this hermit. Um, and then Zosima dies. And this is exactly directly following the Grand Inquisitor conversation. Um, Zosima's body rots. And so he's not given saintly rights. He's not like voted to, to be a saint because he like saints are supposed to have like perfect bodies after they die, but he like festers and smells real bad. Um, and, and so Alyosha in the wake of his potter Seraphicus, his divine father uh, dying and rotting um, with probably the influence of, of Ivan and the Grand Inquisitor on his mind leaves at night um, at the behest of sort of an evil monk, uh, like a envious, jealous guy, Rakitin, um, who tries to send Alyosha into like straight into the drama of like the love story. Um, but Alyosha still goes, but with a, he, he doesn't go to like be a part of the drama. He goes like out of good spirit and has this almost like Nirvana-like waking up moment um, that is all inspired by this conversation with Ivan, this slap as you call it, um, as well as by the, the death of um, his uh, deeply religious convictions with Father Zosima. Okay. Um, Anybody else? We have time for like one more insight, fun fact. Nothing. I really hope you didn't stare at each other for five minutes. Okay, so now we'll look at this sheet, the argument, the cheat sheet. If you print it out on Canvas, if you want to, um, it's I find really helpful to have. I've structured Ivan's arguments analytically in like premise inference conclusion format. Um, it's helpful to have that like in front of you, but you don't need it. It's up to you, extra resource. So the argument of the rebellion, Ivan and Alyosha are settling the eternal question. Oh, before I do this, by the way, after class, we're doing our first week of the reading group. Uh, if you read, or if you just wanna hang out and talk about the book somehow without having read it, um, we'll do, I'll take like a 10, 15 minute break after lecture and then we'll get going. Um, we'll just keep going um, until we get too tired to keep talking about it. Okay, so um, the argument in rebellion that eventually becomes the Grand Inquisitor passage um, in a first pass is just given in a word. So uh, Ivan says, I accept God. This is like his statement. Um, I accept God, all of his wisdom and purpose. Uh, and I also accept the eternal harmony that God represents. So I, I give you, Alyosha, I give the religious person all of their, their um, spiritual and religious, doctrinal, dogmatic, um, and faith-based presuppositions that your entire hopes, all of your hopes and dreams I accept, right? Uh, God exists and heaven exists and blah, blah, blah. Um, but I do not accept the world that God has created. So I accept God and perfection and harmony and eternal bliss, et cetera. But I do not accept this, this place that I am, the place that we are, the world that we live in. And so here's the quote. I believe like a child that suffering will be healed and made up for, that all the humiliating absurdity of human contradictions will vanish like a pitiful mirage, like the despicable fabrication of the impotent and infinitely small Euclidean mind of man. Then the world's finale, at the moment of eternal harmony, something so precious will come to pass that it will suffice for all hearts, for the comforting of all resentments, for the atonement of all crimes of humanity, of all of the blood they've shed, that it will make it not only possible to forgive, but to justify all that has happened with men. But though all that may come to pass, I don't accept it. I won't accept it. So here's like rebellion, right? Even if parallel lines do meet and I see it myself, I shall see it and say that they've met, but I still won't accept it. Um, this is Ivan's proclamation, right? This is his first pass. He says, look, the rapture can happen. All the, the worthy souls can be lifted up to heaven to be forgiven. It can justify all of the, uh, the pain and suffering that was caused on the way to becoming worthy souls in the rapture that go to heaven, but I will not accept it. I will stay here. I will say, screw you, God, right? And, and look right in his eye and say, I'm keeping my feet on this ground because I will not accept your salvation. Why is this? This is like mega cringe lord to the max talk, right? Like he's being real edgy here. Um, 
So Ivan has just painted a picture of the ideal harmony of a world in which God can exist. And he's done it in a pretty charitable light. He said, look, everything that's perfect will justify and um, the impossibility of the world may, um, you know, the world may become impossible and reveal that there is a heaven and afterlife and parallel lines may cross. Um, and God can make up for everything. Um, but Ivan still yet refuses to accept the world. Why is this? Um, how does Ivan make his inference from the possibility of the existence of all of these wonderful harmonies uh, uh, to his conclusion that he can't and won't accept it, that he must rebel against it. Um, to answer these questions, we'll need to outline Ivan's argument. And here's where we start to get um, uh, a robust conception of why Ivan thinks this, why he rebels. Um, so Ivan, begins to explain himself by telling stories. He, he tells the stories of um, uh, wartime soldiers being nailed by their ears to fences and then shot, right? Like tortured and then killed. Um, and then says, wait a second, you know, that like it, maybe they had it coming. They were soldiers, they were in war, adults have all bitten from the fruit, they, they had it coming, right? Um, but you know who doesn't have it coming is the innocent child, the, the children of the world who, um, haven't yet experienced the world that are still uh, pure. Um, and Quentin in, in our group um, mentioned that Alyosha represents the soul and is childlike. And so maybe it's um, uh, no coincidence that Ivan uses a child like Alyosha as, as, uh, as his example here. And so he tells three terrible stories of, of the suffering of children um, whipping a, a, a daughter um, righteously and, and enjoying that there are extra twigs on the branch so it scars more, um, causing a, uh, forcing a kid to sleep in an outhouse in a pile of excrement, um, a kid being fed to dogs because he threw a rock at one, right? Being chased by hounds and consumed um, in front of his mother. Uh, it, what's more horrific than that, right? And these are real stories, right? These are real stories that Ivan has collected from newspapers. Um, and that I wouldn't be surprised if they were real in actual life too. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Dostoevsky had a line on these kinds of stories in his own world and just you know, plagiarized them into his book. Um, that seems like the sort of thing Dostoevsky would do. So the force of Ivan's argument is accented by the suffering of innocence, not just suffering simpliciter by itself, but the suffering of innocence. Um, and so here we have the argument in, in the first premise, uh, the innocent must not suffer for another sins, especially such innocence as children, right? But if you didn't do anything, you don't deserve to be punished, period, especially if you're innocent, especially if you're a child. It's morally abhorrent. It's unforgivable to destroy and harm an innocent. Um, innocence lost is unexcusable, inexcusable. And premise two, in every man, a demon lays hidden. Right, this is the Smerdyakov of the human nature uh, mosaic that is, that is the characters of the brothers Karamazov. In every man a demon lays hidden. Evil is an aspect of human nature, is a part of what and who we are, what we're made of. Um, so we must compromise ourselves to the world. Um, if there's an evil in all of us, or at least a potential for it, um, the need for food to satisfy our desires to survive um, often lead to the expressions of this evil. Um, whether in uh, banal ways, uh, uh, my boss told me to do it, uh, or in explicit ways. I just whipped my daughter with a, a branch with a bunch of extra twigs and was kind of excited about it, right? Pretty evil. Um, and that comes out. So the innocent must not suffer. And by living, we express often the demon that lays inside of us. And so Ivan infers from these, that the evil in us is the reason that ch children suffer as they do. The world is such that it's permissible to harm innocence, that insofar as it's done, it is permissible. We, we can do it. Uh, it is a completely open option to our free will, the, our power of will to decide to uh, pick up our son or daughter and stuff them in an outhouse and lock them in for the evening. We can do that. You shouldn't, but we can do that, right? And so, inferring from one and two, the evil in us is the reason that children suffer. And so the fatal question is, 
is this permissible because we are free or because God willed it? Okay. And we're going to see arguments against either end of this disjunction. So Ivan asks his fatal question. Do you understand why this infamy must be and is permitted? Without it, I am told, man could not have existed on earth, for he could not have known good and evil. Why should he know that diabolical good and evil when it costs so much? Why the whole world of knowledge is not worth that child's prayer to dear kind God. The child is the one in the outhouse, right? Like praying to her savior to save her from the pile of cold frozen excrement that she's sleeping in. The whole world of knowledge is not worth the suffering of that child and her prayer to dear kind God. And so here we have a pretty explicit formulation of the problem of evil. The problem of evil is a classic problem uh, dealt with in theology centuries before um, uh, uh, Dostoevsky and now centuries after still. It's a really fun problem to talk about. Um, if you ever take one of my intro to philosophy classes, which I don't imagine any of you would if you're already in an upper division one, but if you did, I have a whole lecture series about this. It's one of my favorites to do. Um, so the problem of evil just says that God is supposed to be an all-perfect being, tri omni perfection, meaning um, God is omnipotent, omnibenevolent, and uh, omniscient. So all-knowing, omniscient, omnibenevolent, all good, and omnipotent, all powerful. So God has uh, all of the knowledge to know all of the things that are good and bad and how good and bad they are. Uh, God has all of the power to exercise uh, God's will in uh, expressing or realizing, creating any of those possibilities. God knows all of them. God can create any, there's no rock God can't lift, sort of. Um, and God is all good, that uh, God will always choose the maximally good option. Okay. Um, okay, so this is triumny perfect God. This is our conception of God. Uh, and yet kids are being tortured. The world exists and there's evil in it. That's a problem. Um, how can that God exist and the suffering of these innocent children at the same time? How do we make sense of this? And historically, there's all sorts of uh, ways to answer this. Um, and the most famous of which is a theodicy, um, which is uh, a term developed by Leibniz, uh, Theodicy in his book. Um, although it had been like a concept that was around for a long time, that term is attributed to Leibniz. Um, there are, a, a theodicy is a story that you tell about the world. You construct an ontological picture of existence of either God or God's relationship to man or, or mankind's place or whatever um, that makes consistent the apparent contradiction of uh, the existence of evil and the existence of God. How do we make these two things consistent? So one kind of theodicy and the one that Ivan says here, um, the whole world of knowledge is not worth that child's single prayer, um, is a soul-making theodicy. So um, a soul-making theodicy just says that uh, evil exists so that we can overcome it, right? That in order to get past uh, the pearly gates, you have to have proven yourself that good is only possible uh, with evil present and that good is the overcoming of evil. And if good is the overcoming of evil, then there must be some amount of evil present in order for us to overcome it and uh, justify our place in uh, the beatific vision and, and eternal bliss, okay? Um, soul making. And what I've been saying is, screw that. It is not worth it. That um, even if, uh, evil must exist for there to be good. I do not accept the, the God who created the world in which the sort of evil that does exist does, right? That God made this world and said, look, that, you know, some kids are going to have to get whipped and sleep in outhouses, but at least heaven's possible. Uh, Ivan says, I rebel against that, even if it's true. Uh, Sarah, you have a question? Just, I just wanted to say this, it sounds so much like what you said about Camus' view of Algiers versus Sartre's, um, how he, he said, you know, no suffering, one person's torture death was worth the freedom. And it, it makes, I mean, the whole absurdity of the contradiction, it does make Ivan really hard to, like, hard to place. It makes the freedom issue hard to place. Like the difference between Sartre's view and Camus' view that they would break up their whole 
you know, connection over that idea that you allow all that suffering and accept it even within um, an atheistic uh, existentialism of Sartre is in that kind of Ivan's saying, you don't accept it no matter what. And, um, but it, yeah. Yeah, no, you're, you're totally right. And um, I'm glad you picked up on that because Camus loved, adored Dostoevsky. And so no surprise that, um, that, that Camus is, uh, parroting pretty much word for word Dostoevsky and his own um, uh, moral, uh, moralist expression of uh, absurd heroism, right? In rebellion. And Ivan is a rebel, the, the, verb, the very first rebel. Um, and this is the absurd hero that, that Camus sees too. So I, I think that's, um, it, it's a good note to point out. You're exactly right. thinking if he if he does believe in god how but he doesn't believe in the world you know but it seems like he's placing all this blame on god but totally disregarding all of the blame that can be placed on man and the free will yeah so it's like he's choosing where to place the blame for at this point in the at argument point, yeah. so so remember the the oh oops i go backwards um that that there's a, a disjunction in ivan's argument um, so why, why is evil permissible? Why, why is it within our power to do this? It's either because we're free and we're responsible or because God set up the world this way. So this first pass at argument is, um, taking on that second half of this, the disjunction that if God is responsible for the world, then Ivan can't accept it. And it's going to turn out that, um, if we're free, Ivan won't accept it either, except in the condition of the grand inquisitor world that he presents. So good question, because um, that is important to point out the, the sort of structure of argument, right? That Ivan is saying, let's set aside the fact that we might be responsible and look at the possibility that it, this is a God set up system first. Okay, um, so the conclusion from one and three here is that uh, a soul making theodicy is inadequate, of course, right? That the, the suffering of a single child is not worth the whole world. Um, and that it can't be atoned for by any goodness, or at least according to Ivan, Ivan even said that it can be atoned for, that it will be justified in rapture, but he won't accept it. It can't be, or sorry, it won't be for Ivan justified. It won't be accepted by Ivan. Um, Ivan is rebelling against the, the justification that if God declares that this is all fine, um, Ivan will say, still say no. Um, okay. So now to the other half of this junction, the free will thing. Um, there's another kind of theodicy that explains away the problem of evil. It's called the free will theodicy. So what the free will theodicy says is, uh, look, the most important feature of being human is the fact that we have free will, right? That our freedom is what makes us who and what we are. And if mankind is created in the image of God, then uh, finite beings, though we are, part of that image is our free will and, and the purest, best most fantastical, amazing expression of that image is our free will. Um, and what free will does is it promises us the ability to make our own uh, heaven on earth, to make our own forms of atonement, to make our own hell on earth if, if we so choose. Um, and by adhering to the will of God, um, we are not necessarily bound to, um, you know, be like uh, saint robots that, you know, do as we must, but um, rather can act in accordance or out of accordance with. And when we do act in accordance with, uh, we find, you know, beatific bliss. Um, and this is what makes freedom so potent. Um, and so what God does is says, look, uh, I'm going to make you free creatures. You can do whatever you like, and I hope that you really do what's good, and here's all of the tools that you need to be aware of what's good and, and make it into heaven. Um, and this breaks the chain of responsibility uh, from evil to God, right? Because if, if God isn't the one that's created evil, it's, it's us. Our, our will wouldn't be free if we couldn't like create evil. Um, but the value of freedom supersedes the... Uh, the risk of there being any evil, at least according to the free will theodicy, which a fun objection uh, and a cool segment of philosophy of religion and overlap with theology is 
uh, I, and I'll only mention this for a second before moving on, but it is really interesting. Can God take risks, right? If God is triomniperfect, can God take risks? So in a free will theodicy, God is saying, look, I'm making you free. And I recognize that, you know, maybe every person uh, in the world des- decides that, hey, we should have children so that we can beat them, right? Not like because we want children, but like we should have them so we can torture them. Wouldn't it be great to de- like ruin their innocence? Um, that would be awful, like about the worst world you can imagine. And, and that's a possibility because it's a permissible state of things given the fact that we're free. Could, could God be the kind of God that could take that sort of risk? Um, interesting question. Anyways, that's the free will theodicy. Um, Okay, so Ivan's second pass, um, or sorry, third pass at the argument, the first being expression, the second being against the soul-making theodicy. Now he's addressing the free will theodicy. So what's left when we accept the existence of evil in the form of innocence lost? We we accept that um, uh, evil exists in the form of children suffering, um, and we still accept that there's a higher good uh, and a possibility of perfection. Um, This becomes absurd, right? This is where the absurdity begins to, to have a grip in Ivan. And, and Ivan's gonna need to um, come up with a pretty creative solution to deal with this condition of absurdity that he, um, uh, his, his intellect sort of captures and claims about the way that the world is. So he says, let me tell you novice that the absurd is only too necessary on earth. The world stands on absurdities and perhaps nothing would have come to pass without them. We know what we know. And what I know is that I understand nothing. I don't want to understand anything now. If I try to understand anything, I'll be false to the fact that I've determined to stick to the fact. So here, Ivan is saying, look, if it's the case that we're free, if, if we have free will, then we're the ones that are responsible for the innocent losing their innocence, for suffering, the suffering of children. And if that's a fact, then it's a fact that uh, I can't understand, I can't fathom why the world that we live in is one that has made this possible. Um, and uh, I don't want to understand it because uh, to understand that world is to um, uh, it's to look to, it's to stare into the sun, right? It's to blind yourself. Um, may I ask, is that the world with God in it? Yeah, yeah. So, so God exists, and we're free, and the world is still the way it is. That there's the absurdity for you, right? Why doesn't God step in, and why are we the sorts of creatures that would express our free will in that way rather than in that better way that, in the the possible existence of God, um, could lead us towards you know harmony and working together? Yet we choose to beat children and stick them in outhouses. It's pretty awful. Um, so you said possibility of God. So uh, either way, it could be that it's just something that we have or it could be god given yeah yeah um and in either case the absurdity remains because the innocence is lost and children suffer okay yeah so it's it's again it's it's like a non-issue for ivan whether or not god exists um because in the case that god does exist and is responsible for evil then screw you god right says ivan um or in the case that um god does or doesn't exist and the innocence lost and the suffering of children is on us then that's on us and God doesn't have anything to do with that. And the fact of the suffering and the, the kind and type and quality of the suffering, gratuitous evil is what it's called in, in the contemporary literature following um, William Rowe. Uh, uh, the gratuitous suffering of children um, makes the world out to be absurd and, and Ivan can't fathom a world like that. And so this is Dostoevsky's form of absurdism. And we saw a rough sketch of it, we felt hopefully a rough sketch of it in The Stranger. Um, Dostoevsky's form of, the, of absurdism deals directly with this question of God's existence or uh, the problem of evil and, and the strange sort of um, expression of it that God could or couldn't exist. It doesn't make the world any less absurd, but it does really bring and drive the point home. Um, and then for, for Camus, um, uh, the existence of God is, is a non-issue. It's, it, it, like we've already gone past that for Camus and, and Sartre and Beauvoir as well. Um, but here we see very clearly expressed Dostoevsky's form of absurdism. Um, and so what's the consequence of accepting Dostoevsky's absurdist ontological condition? 
Um, well, of course, the inability to understand anything. The, the mind can't cope. Ivan is the mind, right? The intellect. The lack of desire to understand it um, and to hold one's mind the contradiction that's so terrible that we are free and yet we choose to make permissible the use of freedom in this awful, horrendous way. Um, so at this point, any questions, any comments before um, we do arguments really, or sorry, Ivan's strong argument against the free wealth theodicy in the Grand Inquisitor passage? Doing okay? Oh, Sarah. I, I, I really, I'm sorry to Go ahead, keep yeah. Coming, is that why um, Christ was seen as um, um, kind of less powerful than the, the cardinal or the, I forget what he was called, but the religious authority was seen as having the power on earth, which I saw as representing, um, even though he was a religious authority, kind of an atheistic view of um, free will being just part of us, we're evil humans. So the Cardinal was kind of like evil humanity doing evil things because it got power. And then Christ was sort of this non-issue that whether he was there or not was sort of irrelevant. It's like, it's like maybe Christ exists, but it's the, it's the humans with power and corruption who have the, um, the hold on torture and pain in, in the Inquisition. I mean, um, it, it seemed like it was almost saying that he believed in Christ. This was sort of in, confusing to me, this context, but that it was a, not, a non-issue because it was the corruption of humanity that controlled even in the name of Christ. Is that, yeah. what so, is that? So you're, you're one step ahead, we'll, we'll get there. Um, but just to very briefly um, respond, the, the reason you're one step ahead is because Christ is the next step in the argument. This is when Alyosha objects. He says, well, um, so, so free will is, is what makes the world absurd and everything possible, uh, permissible, the suffering of innocence, et cetera. Um, but what if there were a human like us that um, could uh, absorb all of the suffering and sins of mankind and then expiate them, right? Um, Jesus. And, and so Ivan gives the Grand Inquisitor passage as, as a response to the subjection that um, Jesus could actually expiate the sins of humanity. Um, and, and you're mostly right in your interpretation there um, that the, the Christ figure, it's, it's a non-issue that, that he is Christ. But what, what I would um, adjust in your interpretation is the purpose of the Grand Inquisitor. So the Grand Inquisitor is an atheist or, or an agent of Satan even, but maybe only cynically an agent of Satan, really more of an atheist. Um, and, and he doesn't accept Christ and, and doesn't um, give Christ the ability or power to be the Christ that he was uh, because um, not for the sake of power. I mean, he becomes powerful and is powerful, but his power is, is not for his own sake, but for the sake of happiness, for the sake of everyone else, for the sake of the humankind that's too weak to um, be powerful. And, and so he sort of absorbs their freedom and with it, their suffering, um, which makes him, uh, it makes him the, the Christ that would have succumbed to one of Satan's temptations in the desert. Um, so you're saying the Grand Inquisitor is a, is a um, even though he's a religious authority outwardly, we completely ignore that he's he's actually a kind of a, a devil figure, but a, a devil vested in human in hu, in hu, human nature, kind of. Yeah, he's and and, he's, and yet he's he's form a Christ figure around. because he's doing a self sacrificing thing in a way of getting rid of Christ <laughs> under the table. Because why? Because he thinks that, that the hope in Christ or something would be more damaging by way of delusion. I, I'm, I'm just, it's just yeah. confusing to me. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that. So um, the argument against the free will theodicy. Uh, premise one, suffering exists. We've just talked about the suffering of children. Premise two, nobody is to blame for the existence of suffering um, because there is a demon inside all of us, right? That... Um, 
we have to live and you know this causes us to uh, fight one another for resources to um, express and impose our desires on one another and uh, one thing compounds on another and eventually you have um, an evil serial killer who's you know evil because he was he born in a abusive household but you know that sort of thing right um, that the determinist sort of story of cause and effect um, tells a story of evil that though we are responsible for it um, directly, uh, ultimately, nobody really can be. We all are products of our times is sort of the idea here. So inferring from the existence of suffering and that nobody's to blame for the suffering, survival requires that we be complicit in the world's continual production of suffering. If you guys have seen The Good Place, this is like the premise of The Good Place, that um, you can try to be good, but you're still complicit in a bunch of like awful stuff, um, that just by living in today's world, uh, you're being pretty awful. Um, this is the same idea here. So the sorts of free choice that, that we have leads us to unblameable suffering. People freely choose to accept the world by not killing some, themselves, by just living in it, and still suffering is perpetuated. So another premise, maybe this freedom is the price that we have to pay for eventual harmony, that um, maybe we just have to be free so that eventually we can freely choose our way to, to heaven. Um, and Ivan still rejects, this is the conclusion, still rejects that kind of harmony, the sort of heaven that, that we freely choose, that we create here, um, because it's not worth it. Freedom is too high a price to pay for goodness, says Ivan. And while there's still time, I hasten to protect myself, and so I renounce the higher harmony altogether. It is not worth the tears of that one tortured child who beats itself on the breast with its little fist and prayed in its stinking outhouse with it, with its unexpiated tears to dear kind God. It's not worth it because those tears are unatoned for. And in the free world and the world that we're responsible for, the world that um, in which suffering exists and maybe we're all products of our times, Ivan still cannot accept that um, a harmony that comes from that, that, uh, you know, at some point we're imperfect right now, but you know, uh, n plus one time in the future, uh, we've worked out all the kinks and we're in utopia and everything is literally perfect. And then God says, "Okay, you did it. Come up to heaven. Good job, guys. Um, you, you finally freely chose your utopia on earth." Ivan says, "I still stay on the ground um, because and that past point, way back when, don't you remember?" the unexpiated tears of, of the child who beat its breast in that outhouse, praying to dear kind God, those tears are unatoned for. Those tears are still tears. They, they, the, the blood is still in the ground, right? And nothing can make up for that. But why can't it? Why can't God's higher harmony and maybe even the one that we freely choose in our perfect utopia make up for the tears of that suffering child? Well, there's hell, right? Maybe the, 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 punish, the sufferers are punished, sorry, the sinners are punished in hell and, and made to suffer for their sins, their cause of innocence lost. Well, what good does it do to punish an oppressor after the fact? Because the fact has already occurred, the innocence is already lost, and you can't put the snake back in the bottle. You, you, the, once the, what, what's the expression? The genie, thank you. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. God, I'm idioms. <laughs> um, uh, once it's out, it's out. Um, and uh, no perfect wishes can um, make the genie go back in. And what sort of harmony would it be if there was hell? Um, if, if we freely choose our way to utopia and rapture happens, everybody goes into heaven, Beethoven vision, perfect. But then sufferers are still made to suffer in hell. What, what kind of perfect world is that? There are still people, you know, like, like drowning, reaching for food and drink that's just out of reach as they like boil and bubbling water. This is Tantalus, right? Um, boiling and bubbling water. Tantalus is um, the father of, uh, or maybe grandfather of um, Agamemnon and Menelaus, the Greek generals who go to Troy. Um, it's the, the father of the Atreides and cause of all of the tragedy that follows their house. Fun side note. Um, that a world or, or a, a, a cosmos, I suppose, not just like Earth, but like a, a, a 
metaphysical whole, a, a complete existence in which there is a hell and a harmony that like it, it sort of sullies the fact that things are going so well for a few people if there are other souls that are still suffering. Um, which is also something biblically that's resolved by Jesus, right? That Jesus um, goes down into hell during his three days after he's crucified and releases all of those souls and says, hey, you can go back up to heaven, um, which it would be part of the, the context going into Alyosha's like, hey, look, Jesus can save us, uh, objection to this. Um, and finally, Harmony is no good because the harmony is only achieved because it was built on an act. So heinous and evil is to produce it. That free will is produced, the loss of innocence. And what harmony would it be? What kind of perfection would be achieved if it were corrupted? Even um, in such a small way in the grand scheme of things, the whole body of human knowledge, right? Isn't worth that tiny corruption. The, the child beating its breast, um, praying to dear kind God and still sinking and choking on frozen shit in the outhouse as they try to sleep, try to suffer their way through the night and hope for the dawn to come that will be their only salvation, right? Not their parents who locked them in, not dear kind God, but um, the dawn to come. So Ivan says, I would rather remain with my unavenged suffering and unsatisfied indignation, even if I were wrong, even if everything that I've said here is absurd, incorrect, illogical, that parallel lines will cross. Even if I were wrong, I will remain unsatisfied and indignant. Too high a price is asked for harmony. It's beyond our means to pay so much to enter in on it. And so I hasten to give back my entrance ticket. And if I am an honest man, I am bound to give it back as soon as possible. It's not God that I don't accept Alyosha, only I most respectfully return him the ticket. I love that line. It's awesome. This is Ivan expressing himself and rebelling, standing alone against both humankind and God, standing against what he sees the way that humanity has structured itself to, to be such that children can suffer, and standing against the promise of perfection, of harmony, of forgiveness. Um, I must respectfully return him my ticket. Love this. That's rebellion, murmured Alyosha. Right here we have the blatant laying bare of of Ivan's soul, his mind, his his um, his expression of those eternal questions. Right here, answered with rebellion, murmurs Alyosha. So Ivan re resolves himself to rebellion before he'll resolve himself to the justification of a world in which children suffer. And Alyosha is the aspect of soul and innocence. The mind seems here to corner the soul. And with no room to back out, to, to escape from this cornering, Alyosha um, is, is asked a terrible question. Now Ivan has him cornered. Either humans are responsible or God is responsible, and yet the evil that is unexpiable still occurs. Now Alyosha challenges Ivan, the mind to the soul. I challenge you answer. Imagine that you are creating a fabric of human destiny with the object of making men happy in the end, giving peace and rest at last, but that it was essential and inevitable to torture to death only one tiny creature, a baby for instance, and to found that edifice on its unavenged tears. Would you consent to be the architect on those conditions? Tell me the truth. So here Ivan is, is not just being an edgelord, but um, being a knife that cuts. He's pressing himself into Alyosha, um, imposing himself on his, his brother, um, saying, look, I've had these thoughts. Now you must answer me. What would you do? Would you build your perfect harmony? Would you build the world of God, of, of perfection, of um, life uh, forever perfect, if it only had to cost you the torture and death and tears of one child. And Alyosha says, no, I would not consent. I would not bring about the world that I believe in, that I am committed to religiously, um, 
on those conditions, I would not consent. And then Alyosha, in now smushed in the corner and under Ivan's foot, heel of his argument, Alyosha responds with the only response that he has, the only response that humanity has, the, the, the response that inspires Christianity to this day, that Christianity requires um, faith in uh, the um, resurrection of Jesus, right? That Christ come back, um, the return of Christ, that miracle is the one upon which all of Christianity um, uh, uh, lynches on, turns on, right? That um, it's Jesus's resurrection that um, expiates, that forgives, that um, he being uh, spirit, God, and man, importantly, human, um, represents the, 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 through his, the resurrection of his life and uh, release into heaven, the same resurrection of our souls and our new ability to um, go to heaven. And, and so Alyosha invokes in this moment where he would not consent, just as, as Ivan, he doesn't rebel. Notice Ivan rebels, or Ivan remains indig indignant, and Alyosha still has one out. Um, what if there were a Christ? What if there were a Christ that could do this, that could be resurrected, that could be um, uh, the body of man incarnate, and still yet release us from the responsibility of the suffering that um, I won't consent to? And this is where the Grand Inquisitor passage comes in. At this point, uh, Ivan smirks and says, ah, clever. Why didn't you bring up Jesus earlier, right? Normally when I have these conversations with my other uh, intellectuals in Moscow or wherever, like in college, um, they bring up Jesus like right away. You know, I'm talking to a theologian or uh, another philosopher and they're like, oh, well, Jesus solves all these problems. Um, you sort of let me uh, uh, go beyond myself. Um, should have done this earlier. And uh, I do have a, uh, an answer to this question. It's a poem that I wrote. Um, and the purpose of the poem says that even Christ, the forgiving uh, innocent could not save us. That humans, insofar as we are part of this absurd world, uh, are irredeemable, um, or at least must only be in part irredeemable. Um, and the idea here is that even if Jesus did exist, even if there were a Christ figure that could save us, we wouldn't allow Christ to save us. We would still remain here um, out of ignorance, right? Out of weakness and, and uh, incapacity to will uh, in a Christ-like way. Remember, Christ isn't just human. Um, Christ is also spirit and God, um, all three. And if you ask, how does that make sense? Then uh, the uh, church will send the Spanish Inquisition to burn you. Uh, truly, it's, it's a blasphemy to try to answer that question. It's just like a divine mystery, according to the Catholics. Um, it's a heresy to answer the question, even though it's like really theologically interesting. Anyways, um, there's a second purpose to the Grand Inquisitor passage, um, which is that Ivan isn't an nihilist. And, and I sort of intimated this in a moment ago, a moment ago in the, the first purpose, that Ivan isn't a nihilist. He wants to provide an alternative. He wants to say, look, there is a way that in this absurd world, uh, we can make suffering less bad. We can free the world of its freedom and through its freedom of its uh, weakness and the inability to produce a, a more perfect world here on earth. And this is the world that uh, the Grand Inquisitor um, has brought about and that Ivan uh, recommends as the absurd hero. Okay. So Grand Inquisitor passage. Um, any questions, comments um, before we go on to the Grand Inquisitor? Now we've had Ivan's complete argument and now the final pass is um, the Grand Inquisitor. What, any thoughts so far? Um, could you just say what you're saying about him recommending the Grand Inquisitor? Is, is he endorsing the Grand Inquisitor? He yeah. is? Yeah. Ivan sees himself as one of the 10,000 that can 
um, absorb the the freedom of the rest of the weak humankind and and with the freedom they're suffering and um, this is the world that Ivan wants to bring about where there there are those few strong who can set the rules and give people a unified state of worship and uh, feed them bread and tell them that they're forgiven uh, for their sins, um, et cetera, uh, because this would make the world happy and would make people stop whipping children with branches. Um, so yeah, the, the Grand Inquisitor is Ivan's hero. Oh, I thought he was being completely ironic about that. No, okay. Yeah, the Grand Inquisitor is the hero of Ivan's story until the devil retells the story to Ivan um, without changing it. It, it's narratively awesome. So read the book. Cool. Okay. Uh, Scott, you mentioned Snowpiercer. What question uh, does Snowpiercer talk about? Oh, Snowpiercer, Snowpiercer talks about the idea of the suffering of children being allowable in the context of keeping people alive and happy. Sure. Yeah, because you have the children shoveling coal and getting cancer and stuff at the back of the train. Yeah, yeah, that ending uh, answers that question fantastically. Cool. Okay, so Grand Inquisitor. Um, setting the stage, Ivan's poem is set in the 16th century, the height of the Spanish Inquisition in the 1500s now. We're in a small town in uh, Seville, Spain. Um, and Ivan is channeling the spirit of many monks of that day, the way that they wrote um, stories. Uh, the only intellectuals to be spoken of were, were monks, right? Um, and he writes as they would a story in which Jesus comes back to earth. These were really common back then when, when in, in the 1500s, um, it, was, it was really popular to tell the story about how Jesus would return, how Christ would save mankind. And um, every monk had their own sort of like view about what that salvation would look like. And, um, and so, so Ivan is sort of parroting um, these old stories from monks of the 15th century. Um, so enter our small town of Seville, Spain, the day after a great burning of heretics by the Spanish Inquisition, which nobody expected, uh, an auto de fe of 100 people. Uh, the town is settled. Um, guards wait in the hot sun for their shifts to end. The cardinal who ordered the burn is no longer dressed in his crimson robes, um, but instead he switched to his drab monk's robes. The, the town is sort of moved on, but the spirit of that burning is still there. Um, everyone in the town is back to normal, but again, the moral effects are still felt. And it's in this quiet repose of murder, of the death of a hundred by burning um, of, of heretics that uh, Christ returns. And when Christ returns, he comes to the marketplace and performs miracles. Uh, first, he heals a blind man's sight, um, just as... Uh, uh, Saul became Paul, right? Um, first I was blind and then I saw, right? That, that this is um, the first apostle uh, is, is a, struck blind by God for um, lending money. Is that right? I, I think so. Yeah, right. Um, and, and being like kind of a jackass generally. Uh, and, and he, you know, uh, comes to worship God and has given his sight back. So again, Christ performs, re-performs this miracle following in the footsteps of um, the, the past. Uh, and then Christ uh, revives from death a little girl uh, who's you know, bathed in flowers reminiscent of Ophelia right from, from Hamlet um, and uh, recreating the, the next miracle of Lazarus, right? Lazarus being risen from the dead, um, and healed of his, uh, what's the disease where your skin melts away? Leprosy, leprosy right? Yeah, um, that uh, he heals the leprosy and, and uh, the death of, of Lazarus and, and the, 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 now this girl, she's, the, it's history repeating itself. It's the wheels beginning to spin. It's, it's the New Testament sort of getting some fuel and some, uh, uh, you know, some uh, uh, gas in the, in the engine here. And the Inquisitor sees this happening as, as the people begin to um, cheer and, and, and kneel in awe of, of Christ returned. Uh, the Inquisitor sees it happen and, and orders his guards to seize the man. And the people, in spite of seeing these amazing miracles, they step aside. The power, the human power of the Grand Inquisitor, that moral force of the auto de fe of a hundred heretics the day before, is powerful enough for these people 
to deny Jesus, to say, okay, yeah, yeah have him, Cardinal, please. Um, and they, so they part, the crowd parts to make way for the guards. Um, the people are complicit. Um, and the day passes into night before Christ Jesus is brought into the inquisitor's chamber. And the inquisitor demands, is it thou? Is it thou? Right, thou is, so I, I link on our syllabus, I and thou, it's a book by um, Buber that nobody reads anymore, but it's a really great existentialist text that gives like this um, Judaistic Taoist inspired existentialism. It's really cool. Um, and and he, in that book, he deals with the conception of thou as um, not just you, right? But you transcendent, you with like the power and, and ethos of God. When I have faith or, or a, a religious experience, when I um, feel the presence of God, it's not just, look, I, I see you, Christ. It's, I see thou, right? Um, and so here, uh, the inquisitor asks, is it thou, right? With the, the weight of, of the power of God, is it thou? And then be silent. Don't answer my question. And so Christ does, and he remains silent for the remainder of the poem. You come to hinder us, says the inquisitor. But what's being hindered, and who are we? The inquisitor is about to explain everything. And at one point, Alyosha asks if it's simply a mistaken identity. Did, did Maybe this guy just got it wrong, and this guy isn't Jesus after all. Um, he's just some uh, snake oil vendor. And, and Ivan sort of laughs and says, it doesn't matter whether or not it's Christ. What matters is what the inquisitor says. Uh, and again, because the existence of God doesn't matter, it's inconsequential to Ivan's conception of the world as absurd, um, the, the state of redemption from the suffering of, of innocence lost, right? Doesn't matter. Um, so the inquisitor says, tomorrow I shall condemn thee and burn thee as the worst of the heretics. The inquisitor is going to burn Christ, Christ's return, right? And this man of the church, of the faith, is going to burn him like he burned 100 other people yesterday. Why would he do this? Well, Jesus began a project 15 centuries ago. He inspired in the people a freedom so great as to overthrow the Roman Republic, sort of. Um, I mean, the, the Roman Republic eventually accepts Christianity and then is uh, in, in sort of spiritual part absorbed by Christianity, though not entirely until after um, Rome falls does Catholicism really like take over, but still is like, you know, totally integrated with after being... Um, uh, perpetrated and, uh, you know, like uh, Christians were murdered all over the place. Um, so, so Jesus inspires a freedom so great as to like basically overthrow the Roman Republic, uh, to bring the power of Rome down to its knees and to work the free will to, with, with, by working the free will of the people, um, the, the poor and meek, the meager um, into uh, the, the to, to issue them into the fabric of society, of Roman society. But once that task was achieved, the free will given over to was given over to power, the power of the church. And the power of the church became something very different from what Christ originally intended. Um, and for Ivan, the Grand Inquisitor, something far greater. Um, it, 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 it represents something far greater, though something far more terrible. And, and terrible, um, not in a moral sense, but in a... Um, facing the absurd sort of sense, looking into the abyss kind of terrible. Um, so Jesus promises humans freedom, the, the beatific vision in heaven, right? Um, eternal life after death. And he gave them freedom, uh, literally by um, giving them the, the power to break the chains of the um, Roman empire and, and uh, you know, assert their uh, spiritual dominance and, and become a force to be reckoned with. Um, and now people are more persuaded than ever, says the Inquisitor, that they have perfect freedom, yet they have brought their freedom to us, the church, and laid it humbly out at our feet, right? Because people have laid their freedom at the feet of the church for the first time ever, says the Inquisitor, it is possible to think of the happiness of humanity. Happiness is impossible without the sacrifice of freedom, that the people who were originally empowered by Jesus, formed a church that structured hierarchically these powerful cardinals and popes um, to whom they could trust their spiritual lives to and um, 
allow those men to tell them what was good and what was bad and to guide them in the will of God, right? That original Catholicism is all done in Latin. And it's not until the Protestant revolution that uh, Bibles are published in any language other than Latin. You had to be educated to speak Latin. Latin is the, the language of experts in, in all fields in natural, moral, natural and moral philosophy, um, just like science and, and ethics, as well as in theology. Um, and to, to trust the priest is to trust the divine mystery. Um, to give in your freedom, but to say some things are permissible and some aren't, but not to decide that for oneself, but to hear it spoken in the eulogy of the priest, right? The only part of the, the mass that wouldn't be in Latin would be the eulogy, the, here, let me tell you what's going on. Um, do as I say, not, not always as I do, according to Catholic priests in private back then. Um, so because the people have laid their freedom down at the feet of the church, happiness is now possible because the church can give the people what they need to be happy to resolve their suffering, right? And maybe they'll lose out on the possible eternal afterlife by um, giving up their freedom, but at least they'll be happy and they'll be fed here. And this is the absurd state of humankind's position in the world that, that Ivan is, is constructing for us. We must either be free and powerful or unfettered and happy. Would we rather be free or would we rather be happy? And I don't think for Ivan, this is my interpretation. I don't think for Ivan, it's a matter of choice. I think that freedom happens to some of us and happiness to others of us, right? Um, and it's the responsibility, so says Ivan, as he expresses to the Grand Inquisitor passage, um, it's the responsibility of those who are free to use their freedom responsibly. And the Grand Inquisitor represents what it means to use your freedom responsibly, even if it's uh, like a satanic or um, uh, anti-Christian uh, way of directing the world. So by giving people freedom, the Grand Inquisitor continues, thou didst reject the only way by which people may be made happy. Freedom and happiness are independent projects. And Christ gave people freedom, and insofar as he did so, made it impossible for them to be happy. Um, again, not surprising. Uh, the Christians were uh, perpetrated and, and killed and crucified all over the place. Uh, and, and they did so because they expressed their religious freedom in a, in a society that didn't want it. But, says the Inquisitor, Jesus had three opportunities to um, resolve the suffering of mankind completely, to give mankind what they needed to be happy, to not suffer, to expiate, or at least not cause the need for expiation of that one child's tears. And these are the three temptations. So uh, just before uh, Jesus is crucified, he's out in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. This is a story many of us probably are familiar with. Um, and as many of us might be familiar with, when you're out in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, things can get a little weird um, you spend some time in the desert and you have a bit of a trip and Jesus had a bit of a trip. And at the end of it um, is hallucinating, experiencing is visited by Satan who wants to tempt him and say, look, don't do all this reconciliation, uh, being reborn stuff. When, when you get out of this desert, you're going to be killed. And uh, you know that, and I know that, and I want to offer you an out, Mr. Jesus Christ. Um, I want to give you and everything that you stand for exactly what you need to follow through. Um, but you just got to, you know, uh, not go back and be killed by the Romans and Pontius Pilate. Um, and so Satan tempts Jesus three times in the desert. Um, and the Grand Inquisitor calls these three temptations the only miracle, right? I, I think this is a really powerful expression that Christ now come back has just brought a little girl back to life. A little child has been reborn. Um, and one wonders, how did that child die in the first place, right? Was that child left in the outhouse to die and then dressed up with flowers and, and brought through town to um, show the parents, um, uh, to, to, for the parents to show that they actually did love their child? Like, fake love um or did that child have an awful fever and suffer to death right the the rebirth of the child here doesn't make up for the death of the child in the first place 
But you know what would have made up for the death of the child if it didn't have to die in the first place, right? And this is why the Grand Inquisitor says that the three temptations are the only real miracle. Um, because what matters to the Grand Inquisitor is the greater good, right? It's not freedom, but it's happiness for all. And because those three temptations were stated, their possibility and permissibility became real on earth. And this is what the church embodies and has tried to embody for the last 15 centuries. That um, insofar as, as uh, the devil in tempting Christ said, look, this is a possible thing that could happen in the world. Um, it, th those paths of action became um, possibilities. Uh, and that's the miracle that the Grand Inquisitor is, is um, talking about that we can actually bring these things about on earth. Um, and so says the Grand Inquisitor, the wisest people came together for 15 centuries. They established an order that would take the freedom of humankind and exchange it for the gifts of those three miracles. Rulers, chiefs, priests, learned men, philosophers, kings, all became enabled by Satan's precedent to strive for something greater than freedom and suffering for its absolution through power. And here is like, wow, you know, like the, no, the good thing that the Spanish Inquisition wasn't around at the time that Dostoevsky was writing, because he would have been in big trouble. Uh, these are really very um, inflammatory expressions that, that Ivan is, is um, going very hard, as, as we say in, in our 21st century dialect. It's going very hard. Uh, and, and um, just being an edgelord, but sort of powerfully so, right? Um, okay, so for in those three questions, the whole subsequent history of mankind is, as it were, brought together into one whole and foretold, and in them are united all the unsolved historical contradictions of human nature. So the temptations give an opportunity to absolve the world of its absurdity, that if Jesus, if Christ had accepted these temptations, they, it would have happened like that. But now it's been up to the church for the last 1500 years to um, recreate the conditions under which these temptations could become possible in, in actual realities, says the Grand Inquisitor. So if the Grand Inquisitor and his learned group of empowered people can reform the world, they can also remove the world's bite, the bite of absurdity. Nothing has ever been more unsupportable in human society than freedom. People are not strong enough to bear it. And so what are the temptations? Well, the first one is bread. Um, and Christ turns down bread for the whole world to feed every person uh, indefinitely forever. And what is freedom worth if obedience is bought with bread? Right? Well, what if, if you're starving and I offer you a loaf of bread, but I say, hey, you got to follow me for a while. What's that freedom worth? Right? If that person will say, okay, I'm pretty damn hungry. Um, there is no crime and therefore no sin. There is only hunger. And the church offers bread. Right in, in every mass, the Eucharist is offered after it's blessed. And I mean, this isn't like, it's like a little thin wafer. You don't feel sated after eating it. Um, but, you know, like that's what's represented um, in a church, like feeds the poor, et cetera, that sort of thing. Um, and so the Grand Inquisitor here is telling Jesus that prior to any power that the spirit may have in the common person, the first and most powerful need is to fill one's stomach. And so whatever freedom that you have, however much that's worth, you're always going to choose your stomach before it. And that's what's important. So by feeding the people, um, they can, that the people will give up their freedom and, and make the church responsible for it, but they're happy. Their, their stomachs are filled. They're satisfied, right? Um, though some people can bear an empty stomach for the greatness of spiritual salvation. Some can live with their freedom. Some will deny the bread. Some like Jesus in the desert are strong enough to say, this is a temptation. I will keep my innocence. I will keep my empty stomach and my dignity, my freedom. Um, but these people are few. I mean, I, I don't know what I would do if I were starving, right? Would I have the wherewithal to say no to the bread that was offered to me um, in exchange for uh, obedience? I don't know. I've never been starving like that before. Um, but of course there are all sorts of people like that, though there are few. And so the Grand Inquisitor says, dost thou care only for the tens of thousands of the great and strong, those who can deny the bread? While the millions numerous as the sands of the sea, who are weak but love thee, 
must exist only for the sake of the strong, right? Is it, and here's a soul-making theodicy. Grand Inquisitor says, look, if what you're doing is, is offering freedom, um, then only 10,000 people or so in the world can accept that when their stomachs are empty. Is the starvation of all those millions that are like as many as the, the grains of sand in the sea, um, is their suffering worth these 10,000 people who are strong enough to live by and for themselves? Well, probably not. So the result is that giving bread um, causes the church to endure the freedom of those millions who um, can, uh, who need it, who can't live by their freedom. And so here's, the, this is, uh, I'll go really quickly through this because um, we're running out of time. Um, in Plato's Republic, there's a story of the noble lie. So Plato's Republic is all about like how you should structure a society. There's no like atomic families in Plato's Republic. Um, all the children are like raised together and the parents like give up their, their kids. And Plato says people are born with different color souls, metals of your soul. There's the bronze, the silver, and the gold. Um, and bronze people are like janitors, street cleaners, soldiers. The, the silver souls are the ones that do um, like, uh, they're like lawyers and doctors. And then the gold souls are like the oligarchs, the really, um, the great people. And the, the, there's this concept of a noble lie. So in the Republic, a noble lie must be told that the leader of the Republic must um, uh, tell everyone that, uh, that there's no such thing as like the medals of your soul that, um, uh, that people must necessarily be um, put in their right groups. And it's the oligarchs, these like gold souls that know the gold souls and the bronze souls and the silver souls and they can separate them. And um, that the gold souls, if they give birth to a bronze soul, that, you know, the bronze soul has got to go away. And if bronze souls give birth to a gold soul, that, that gold soul has got to get stolen away. And the noble lies to all of these parents that want their kids to be just like them. Um, but we must lie to these um, people. Um, we must allege that there is an oracle that the city shall be overthrown when the man of iron or brass is its guardian, right? That um, the, the whole world will rend asunder and we'll all die if we don't uh, keep the division of souls correct. And it's only by lying in this way that we can have a perfect society that works really well. So this is the noble lie. And similarly, we have a noble lie in, in the Grand Inquisitor that the church says, look, um, give us, uh, we'll give you bread and you just do what we tell you and all will be well. Um, you can still act as freely as you want. You can still sin and we'll forgive you. And we'll say that it's real actual reconciliation, that, that you have actually um, uh, uh, expiated your soul before God, but we're going to be the mediators of that, right? We stand in the booth next to you um, and have you repeat the prayer, forgive me, Lord, for I have sinned, right? Um, and, and in this lie, uh, the priest says, uh, go forth and do your penance. Um, but God hasn't actually forgiven you. You've just um, made yourself feel a little bit better and you'll probably sin a little bit less next time. So the world's that much happier, right? Um, this is the noble lie. This is the, the noble lie of the Grand Inquisitor's Church, of Ivan's world of the 10,000 who are strong, who absorb the suffering um, of those uh, many grains of sand in the sea, um, people who need bread, right? Um, okay. So the second temptation uh, Jesus won't, he, he refuses to cast himself down from the rock that he's standing. He's standing on like a big cliff. Um, and Satan says, look, all you got to do to not get murdered is jump off the cliff and then float. If you can fly in front of people, prove that you're the son of God, right? Um, and Jesus says, no, because faith is supposed to be the, the powerful motivating factor, that it is your free will to choose to believe and follow in the light of God that is what brings salvation. And to force that would be to um, remove the freedom from the people, right? To jump off the cliff and to show oneself as a divine being would be to get rid of the free choice. Obviously, you can't choose, you can't say no, that guy's not actually flying in front of me when he's actually flying in front of me, right? Um, 
but thou didst not know that when man rejects miracle, he rejects God too. For when man seeks not so much God as the, for man seeks not so much God as the miraculous. And so the church promises all sorts of miracles, like forgiveness, like reconciliation. It promises a miracle every time there's a mass on Sunday, right, with the Eucharist. That's a miracle, right? When um, the the uh, the body and blood of Christ are um, are instantiated in the little wafers and in the wine. That this is a miracle every Sunday that um, all churchgoers, all, all people at the mass who are um, absolved of their sins um, uh, take part in. And so they're looking not for God, but for miracles. And what you deny them is uh, what they're looking for. They can't find God, but they can at least find miracle when we nobly lie to them and tell them it's there. Um, And finally, the third temptation is the rejection of a single kingdom on earth. And this is the unity of worship stuff that we read in the Grand Inquisitor passage. So by, uh, and this temptation is Satan saying, look, um, I'll give you all of the, the armies of Rome, all of the power of Rome. You can be the emperor, um, new Caesar, uh, Caesar Christ Jesus. Um, and you rule the world and everybody follows you and does what you say and um, nobody breaks those rules right? Um, and Jesus says, no, I, I won't live by the, the thousand swords and whatever. By taking this temptation, had Jesus accepted it, he would have solved all of the absurd, absurd problems that the world represents for human nature. He would have unified the world under one worship, and he would have been able to um, feed and unify everyone. He would have made them slaves, right? He would have made everyone a slave to his will and his vision as Caesar or Christ Jesus. Um, but he would have unified them. Because what people want to do is unify themselves under one banner of worship. Um, and this is why, according to Ivan, uh, there's all these religious wars, why the Orthodox Church fights with the Catholic Church, why um, the Jews and the Christians and, and the Muslims all, you know, fight head to head is because they're saying, hey, I got this right. You don't have this right. I want you to be saved too. Um, but if we could all agree, if we could all just get along, right, wouldn't we all be that much happier? And of course, and Jesus says, no, we all must freely choose because that is how, that's the road to salvation, right? And so the Grand Inquisitor now accuses Christ, thou art proud of thine elect, but thou hast only the elect, while we give the rest to all. The Grand Inquisitor, again, is working for the greater good, while Christ is accused of only working for the good of the elect and the strong, those who can abide their own freedom. And so the Grand Inquisitor reveals his own kingdom of heaven on earth. But what happens when he finally gets his way and the work is complete? The people are fed, people are unified, people, people are told that they can sin and be forgiven for it. When they do sin, the leaders take that suffering into themselves. They act as vessels of the suffering for the, of the, of, for the suffering of their slaves. And says the inquisitor, all will be happy, all the millions of creatures, except the hundred thousand who rule over them. For only we who guard the mystery shall be unhappy. And so the Grand Inquisitor concludes. And the Grand Inquisitor says that he was tempted too, but he returned from the desert, ready to take on his task. I awakened and would not serve madness, what he's accusing Jesus of, freedom, right? I turned back and joined the ranks of those who have corrected thy work. I left the proud and went back to the humble for the happiness of the humble, Dixie, which is Latin for like, uh, ergo, like I I've spoken. The spake Zarathustra, right? That sort of thing, right? Um, Dixie, I'm complete. And so what are we to make of the Grand Inquisitor's mystery? The one that a hundred thousand suffer for, but that feeds and unifies the whole world and frees them from the burden of freedom. That even if humans are free, they will always mess up. That's the world we're in. And if even if humans are given the opportunity for divine forgiveness, they'll be unable to accept it. And this is because the world is absurd. The reason for the suffering, and the absurdity is the reason for the suffering of children. If Jesus could save us by forgiving our sins, should we only freely choose his path, we would fail. Or at least most of us, maybe like the 10,000 elect would be able to do it, but the many millions more of us would fail. And Alyosha objects weakly, says, but this is the Roman way, not the Orthodox church. And even so, the Grand Inquisitor is a fantastic person. He's fictional a wild abomination. 
And Ivan's rep response says it only takes one, that you only need one sort of person like this to build the world in that vision. That whether the Grand Inquisitor, as I've conceived of him, says Ivan, um, is fictional or not, he's possible. And the possibility is uh, what inspires me, says Ivan. And Ivan replies again that it's not crazy and that all it takes is for one person in the position of power to cause the dominoes to fall. But how does the passage end? Well, Christ never replies. The Grand Inquisitor is out of energy and out of breath, and he asks Jesus to speak, but Jesus has nothing to add. He remains silent. Jesus simply kisses the Grand Inquisitor on the lips. And the Grand Inquisitor tells Jesus to go, to be free, but do not come back. What are we to make of this enigmatic ending, right? That Christ kisses the Grand Inquisitor on the lips and then walks away. What does this mean? So this is my interpretation. Jesus has been commanded to remain silent, right? From the very beginning of the passage. Any more words that Christ says, if Jesus in this passage is to say anything else, it's to add to scripture. It's to do exactly what the Grand Inquisitors accused him of doing, trying to come back and restart the mission that he started 15 centuries ago. That if Jesus speaks in this story, um, he is uh, forsaking what the Grand Inquisitor has just told him and saying, look, uh, you're wrong. That freedom is really what's important. And so he doesn't speak. In the story of the Grand Inquisitor, Jesus stands up and kisses the Grand Inquisitor and then walks away. Jesus is a force of love and compassion, right? He's like love and compassion incarnate, so says the New Testament. He cannot speak because to speak would be to forsake again the Grand Inquisitor, the church, all of the happiness that the church has brought about all these years. But he still has one sort of freedom that he can give without forsaking the Grand Inquisitor and the world in the way that the Grand Inquisitor has said. Without words, Christ, and this is my interpretation again, for the story, Christ condones the acts and the goals of the Grand Inquisitor by kissing him on the lips. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't add anything to a story. It's an act of compassion, of love. He loves with all the compassion of a Christ figure, the man who has mistaken himself for an agent of the devil. The Grand Inquisitor hates himself. He's suffering because of what he's done, the role that he stands in, right? He's one of those powerful elect that um, promises the world happiness, but absorbs their suffering. And Christ forgives and loves that man who's mistaken himself for an agent of, of the devil. Jesus says in the kiss that the Grand Inquisitor is free to make his world a reality. This is, again, my interpretation. Um, free to interpret however you like, and um, I'm sure there's all sorts of interesting ways to do it, but this is how I read it. And Ivan completes the story. The kiss glows in his heart, but the old man adheres to the idea. The end. And so Ivan concludes with the fatal Karamazov phrase. Alyosha asks, how will you live? How will you love with such a hell in your heart and your head? How can you? If this is what you believe, that this is the true settling of the eternal questions for you, Ivan, how can you go on? And Ivan replies, there's strength to endure everything, right? Uh, it was in this time that I remembered what Mama used to always say, that you could always find something to be happy about, right? There's strength to endure everything, says Ivan. That's the strength of the Karamazovs. It is the Karamazov way. Everything is permissible. And again, to be a Karamazov is to be a representation, a part of what it is to be human. And so, again, my interpretation, but if we displace Karamazov with human, there's strength to endure everything. That's the strength of humanity. It is the human way. Everything is permissible. And Alyosha is shaken to silence by Ivan's reply. The soul, Alyosha, no longer has anything to add to this discussion, to this conclusion made by the mind. And so Ivan says, I thought that going away from here, um, I'd have you at least, but now I see there's no place for even me in your heart, dear hermit. Um, Ivan rebukes himself. He feels ashamed of what he said, who he's revealed himself to be to 
his beloved brother, as the soul, right? The formula, all is lawful, I won't renounce. Will you renounce me for that? Yes. And Alyosha, without a word, stands up, walks over to Ivan, and kisses him on the lips. To which Ivan replies, well, that's plagiarism. And Alyosha replies with silence. And they both go out into the world having answered the eternal questions. The end. Yes. <laughs> so again, this is my interpretation. I think that Alyosha's kiss is, because Alyosha doesn't say anything in this whole conversation, like two chapters, he's just like listening to Ivan drone on, um, is Alyosha settling his eternal question, is doing the same thing that uh, Christ did to the Grand Inquisitor, is kissing him and saying, all is permissible, yes. What you've said um, need not be evil, that it can be loved as well. Um, I think that's what the kiss conveys. There's chat stuff. Devin has a brown soul. Sarah wants a rubber soul. Ivan has a glue soul, right? Because everything bounces off everybody else and sticks to it. Maybe Christ is endorsing the freedom of choice of the Grand Inquisitor. And all. Yep. Interesting thought. Well, anybody else have anything to share before we close up, take a break, and move over? It, by the way, is anybody here going to do the reading group? Hands. One. Sarah. Anybody? Yeah, Quentin. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So there's a couple of us. Um, I mean, that, that's the end. Uh, anybody have any interpretations? Like, what does the kiss mean? No? Yes. Go ahead. What do we do if we do interpret it as Christ condoning the, the actions of the Grand Inquisitor? How do we make commensurate the obvious contradiction there that Christ preaches one thing and he's also happy take it as another absurdism or it as a lie which is antithetical to Christ I mean but then he skirts around that by not saying anything I don't know it just this is Dostoevsky's answer to the absurd right that um, as I said in the beginning that Dostoevsky's characters sin their way to Jesus is like Nabokov's quote this is Ivan sinning his way to Jesus that um, you get all the way or you get to the east by going all the way west, right? And this is what the Grand Inquisitor has done. Um, and it's absurd, yes, but it is um, lovable. And, and, and I don't think that Christ is committing a contradiction. I think in fact that remaining silent and kissing the Inquisitor on the lips is the only way to um, move forward non-paradoxically. Because to speak would be to forsake the happiness and the... Um, the expiation of suffering that the Grand Inquisitor promises the world, which is a part of Christ's mission, right? Um, to love the world and, and uh, bring about like ultimate compassion and um, to see heaven on earth, et cetera. Uh, and, and the Grand Inquisitor is not actually so evil, really. I mean, it, he sort of cynically interprets himself as evil, as, as an agent of Satan, as like accepting the temptations or whatever. Um, but, but, but he's really actually constructing like the kingdom of heaven on earth, right? It's just the way that he conceives of it comes from, uh, not from a place of faith, but from a place of like reasoning, um, of like eyes open to the world and the way that it is to the absurdity of things. Um, and the kiss is the forgiveness for bringing about the kingdom of heaven on earth from the opposite direction, right? Not from a place of faith and freedom, but from the place of what appears to be obedience, slavery, and subjugation. So I 
guess another thing that comes to mind just from that is it, does Christ also have a bit of the metals then? That's that he's, he's saying that, you know, there are these 10,000 and I condone their actions and the reasoning that they have. And by them being the only free ones, that's how the other people achieve happiness. And I never explicitly say that, but the way I want things to be is that way. Yeah, that, that's a great question. For Dostoevsky, yes. Yeah. For any other form of Christian faith, absolutely freaking not. <laughs> totally no. I mean, this this is just like screaming antichrist to anybody in any other faith. Like if um, you're thoroughly Catholic and you read this, you, yeah. Right. Um, if you're thoroughly Orthodox and you read it, right? Like I wasn't kidding when I said Dostoevsky is real damn lucky the Spanish Inquisition wasn't around when he wrote this because uh, he would have been in some hot trouble. But Dostoevsky creates his own strange form of Christianity. Yeah. yeah. So when I read the kids, I read it as in like in parallel to like Judas kissing Christ before mm -hmm. he was like mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, crucified. So it was like very much like on having like Christ kiss um, the Inquisitor and being like, like I'm leaving you now with whatever consequence. Like it was much more like a darker, a yeah, much darker read. Like I'm leaving you with the consequences of your actions, and like I'm gonna be gone now, and whatever you do is what you do. And if some people find salvation through this, good on them. But like you won't. Yeah. <laughs> type of thing. Oof. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think that's a totally valid interpretation. Um, <laughs> dark, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so here's a question then. If we turn the story on its head, right? We twist the key the other way to the darker way. What do you make of Alyosha's kiss? once again condemning his brother and like being like the the pure soul which can't be touched really um but it well like it absorbs everything but it like can't be touched or changed and so he could be like jesus kissing and being like i'm the pure and i'm actually the one that's gonna be like go into salvation mm -hmm. but you who's rejecting this isn't which works with pity yeah. It's almost like with pity, like yeah. It it also circles back for me, like to the childlike or the children. It's like the humor of the child, like a child will ramble and they'll talk and they'll share absurd opinions. You just kind of kiss them and pat them on the head. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so for your feedback. Thanks for your opinion. Like I know. Wild. So it's like the believer almost being like, okay, thanks for <laughs> yeah. sharing your opinion, yeah. but I know you're wrong. But I'll just kiss you and send you on your way. Okay, yeah, that totally makes sense. So you can have a completely dark interpretation of this, yeah. right? Where where there is no salvation, where uh, the Grand Inquisitor is purely evil, and uh, and it's consistent with Alyosha's kiss if if they're both out of pity. Ooh, oh. <laughs> wow, Sarah. Sorry, the the text on my screen is like super itty bitty because it's. I have the screen mirrored on the television so that it's like everybody's in class, kind of. It's, it's taken on the resolution of the television, which is amazing. It says, when Dostoevsky has a devil repeat the grand Inquisitor's plan later, is he revising Ivan's endorsement of plan of force and slavery to obtain happiness, but the money for value individually in the same way? Is the grand Inquisitor kind of the authoritarian one to allow the suffering and the money to provide the advantages to the more? No, it's, it's the other way around, right? So it's the, the, it's the few that suffer, right? Everybody else does really well. Um, the powerful one. Oligarch. We've lost your audio. I sorry, couldn't hear it at all. Hello? No? Still good. Okay, good now. Uh, yeah, got it's, it. It's the, other way, it's the other way around. That it's the the few that suffer and the many that do really well. And the oligarchs like uh, they they don't 
get all this power for the sake of themselves to become like Jeff Bezos billionaires, they're, they're actually like legitimately accepting and absorbing the suffering of the millions that are like the grains of the sand in the sea. Um, Yeah, um, but yeah, the, the the devil does flip this on its head. And okay, so setting aside the dark interpretation, um, if we accept my lighter hearted one, let's like get to the, get to salvation by going all the way to hell and back, I right? get to the east by going all the way west. Um, then the devil is like giving the dark interpretation, right? And that's the, like exactly the story. and. Here's where like the absurd gets totally expressed is that there's no change. There's only a change in character. Like who's telling it? Um, is it Satan's plan or is it Ivan's? Um, and there's your absurd, right? That the same idea can be, can express salvation and the kingdom of heaven on earth and also darkness, subjugation, slavery, right? So Ivan has brain fever. <laughs> and, you know, it, that chapter, it ends, he's like having brain fever and dying. And, and um, uh, it, it ends with um, uh, Ivan like throws a glass of water at the devil, which is like Luther did, right? When, when Luther expelled the devil who was trying to tempt him, just like the devil tempted Jesus. Um, Luther throws a glass of water. So Dostoevsky like has Ivan throw a glass of water at the devil um, and then wakes up to Alyosha banging on the door. So in, in that like moment of crisis, um, uh, Ivan rebels against the devil, probably to death, unless it were for Alyosha and his soul, like coming to save him again this time with more than just a kiss, but a good doctor and stuff as well. Read the book, it's friggin' awesome. It, there's a free version audiobook. The The guy who reads it is good, but his voices are all really strange. Um, so you just gotta get used to that. But yeah, if you want the audiobook for free, it's on Audible and you don't have to pay anything for it. I'm gonna stop the recording here. Um, so goodbye people in the future. See you next week.